Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Glad to see everyone here. We're going to go ahead because our guest for today needs to go on to her next meeting before too long. So we want to get started. My name is Sarah Sutton. I'm the CEO of Environment and Culture Partners. I've got some other team members with me today, Danielle Sikowski and Stephanie Shapiro. And we've got um, our presenter today, Stacia Pironi from Kansas City Zoo. So I want to give everybody a quick overview and then I'll turn it over to Stacia and then um, Misha Eagle from NBI, the other half of the talent team with Stacia today, for, will be talking about um, more about Energy Star Portfolio Manager. So you're here for the first 2023 installment of the Carbon Inventory Project office hours and meetings. So today we're going to be looking at doing your record keeping when you're part of a larger entity, when there are more moving parts to the information process. And then we'll have office hours afterwards at the end for anyone to ask any questions that they'd like to ask. We are here in our sequence of training as we move up towards June 1st, which is the day that people will share their information for the 2022 year for energy use. And then on the 16th, when we'll announce that total. And now that we're in 2023, we're asking folks who are interested in participating in sharing this information to actually sign up for the Carbon Inventory Project. That means telling us that you are committed to participating. And the bonus is that by doing that, you're going to start showing others that we're a growing family of folks who are measuring, monitoring, and reporting their energy carbon information. So um, I see that Danielle has just put the link in the chat. You'll get another one at the end of today's presentation so that you can find that easily. And of course, you can find it on the Environment and Culture Partners website for Culture Over Carbon. So I'm going to stop sharing in a moment and turn it over to Stacia in order to talk about her experience for doing this work. Thank you so much. Um, so I am Stacia Peroni from the Kansas City Zoo. I am the Director of Conservation and Education, and um, that's a newer role for me. It's new to the zoo as well, but prior to that, I was the Conservation Manager for seven years, and um, here we see conservation and sustainability as one. Um, and so I, you know, besides doing all of our saving wildlife all over the world, I was in charge of all of our green initiatives, which includes, you know, monitoring our usage and whatnot. And so that position actually was new when I took that on seven years ago. And so I have been through um, the whole process of trying to make sure we were gathering data and um, in a useful manner that we could apply to things um, just like this project um, that you all are going to be participating in. Um, and so I will say, it's going to take some effort when you're first doing this, but I'm telling you, it makes so much of a difference once that you, you find a system um, and it makes it very easy. Not only did we participate in Culture Over Carbon last year, which is part of this larger IMLS grant, um, but I have to do reporting to AZA, which accredits um, zoos and aquariums every year on our on our usage. Um, we also did our greenhouse gas inventory this year. And so because we put the effort in years ago to start make, managing these systems um, and making them very efficient, it's been a lot easier for me to be able to participate or us, the zoo, to be able to participate in um, things like this because we already have the data ready to pull. Um, and it also makes us more energy efficient uh, here because we know what's typical and what's not. And when we see something changing in our data, it's very easy to pinpoint. So I will tell you, whether you have someone in a role that this is their full-time job or not, it doesn't really matter. It's nice, you know, for somebody to have ownership of the responsibility of pulling it all together, but it is definitely a group effort. Um, I, you know, as a zoo, which I'm sure is similar to other, in, you know, organizations, we are like a small city. We have every type of department you can think of. And it's interesting. And I think you'll find in your journeys too, 
the place where you maybe think you need to find the information is not the right place. Um, the one that makes most sense off what you know in your head is not the right place. Um, so I will tell you probably the biggest department that's been key to us managing our data um, is our finance department. And um, and that's simply because they're very organized and they are obviously tracking our spending. And you know what comes along with spending is bills. And those bills are typically tied to the things that you need for these energy reports. Um, and so that was one of the first connections I made. And we discussed how they were tracking the bills, um, if they were just paying them, if they had spreadsheets. Luckily, ours were very organized, and so they had spreadsheets. We actually, like I said, we're 206 acres. We have 92 buildings, um, so I have 63 energy, uh, or sorry, electric meters, and about, uh, you know, 32 gas meters. Um, so we have quite a bit to track just on those two fronts alone. Um, but our um, finance department was tracking that obviously for expenditures per meter, then a total. And so instead of them tracking their bills and then giving them to me, I just asked if we could add a column into their spreadsheet that had our, you know, kilowatt hours, our usage. And so they actually do that for me and pass it along every month. But it just really simplified the system. And that's where a lot of this you'll find is work smarter, not harder, because why duplicate an entire spreadsheet when literally they were like, it would be much easier for us to add just one more number when we're inputting our number into our spreadsheet. So that was a huge one for us. Um, and they do the same thing with that for our gas as well. Um, and then it was very interesting for um, our participation in this using this Energy Star um, manager and for Culture Over Carbon, um, our reports, because we had to do, you know, kind of the building square footage and things like that. And um, you will find as well, like I said, that sometimes people are doing the same thing in different areas. So as I started asking questions, of course, I first went to facilities um, and they had some some updated information on some of the buildings. But as I was digging through um, something and talking to our safety manager of all people, they had done an audit. Um, for safety purposes. And so they sent me a whole building breakdown, which had had the square footage, the year they were built, the location in the zoo. Um, and then, so that like started off, you know, we're like, okay, great, we have this template. And then our facilities manager had started doing a, um, or had a spreadsheet of kind of the HVAC systems and the history of those within the buildings. And so we merged the two um, and then come to find out our finance department had to do an audit of all of the condition space and spaces within the zoo as well. And so instead of all of us doing our own, we combined efforts and we have this now beautifully laid out spreadsheet of every single building, what the building number is, how big it is, when it was built, um, what what the condition space looks like, because, you know, especially at a zoo, some of our space is not the whole building's not conditioned, just maybe a part of it is like the, you know, some holding space or some keeper space or whatnot. And then um, again, with the um, the history was very nice to put into our specifically for this um, reporting, I could go back and say, this is when this equipment was, you know, upgraded in here or whatnot. So that took a collective effort of four different departments, um, but we were all already doing it. And had we not talked, we would have had all four been doing the exact same work. So it was very much, um, uh, a, a good thing for us to reach out and talk to each other and split up the effort um, and share information because it cut down on time. Because I will say that if you aren't already collecting that, it's a lot easier to backtrack bills than it is to go back and try to put a whole kind of with the buildings and whatnot, that's a, a, a little more difficult. So it's nice to reach out because you never know. Like I would have never thought to go ask finance or the safety department 
for our building information. Um, so there are, you know, those are the things that I think of, I would highly suggest that you put it out there. If you have like a board of directors meeting where all the department heads are there or whatever to like say, hey, we're working on this. Is anybody else doing this? Because you, like I said, you will be very surprised who in your organization actually has that information or may be working on it. Um, and I won't get into it, but we collect a lot of different data and I have found it over and over again that it's not who you typically think it is. I think you're always gonna veer towards like your facilities department. And a lot of times that's not who has the information you need. Um, so those are my, my big, um, my big learning curve, but um, that we had to do that first year. And like I said, it took some time, um, but now it's just a well-oiled machine and we all know where those documents live and whatever our role is in updating those, they're consistently updated. So like I said, when the opportunity came up to participate in this grant, it was very easy for us to say, absolutely. Um, but I don't want that to deter you if you, you know, haven't, collected the data um, or this is your first time because this is putting yourself in this situation is the best way to start collecting the data. It, it shows you what you need and maybe where you're lacking and it's a great guide to get you up to speed. So you've got to start somewhere and, and you know, joining a project like this um, is really a catalyst to getting your organization involved in, in I just feel like unless you're involved in something like this or, you know, participate in some sort of reporting, um, it's going to take a lot longer. So I think with the timelines and the guides and having this collective um, group of people to help, that's the other thing. Reach out when you guys start working on this. That was a big thing. We were talking, we were meeting, we were reaching out to other organizations to say, how are you doing this? What are you doing? Um, and everybody's more than willing to share typically. Um, so you don't have to build out your own spreadsheets or whatnot. Um, that's kind of the gist of it. Do you want me to cover anything else, Sarah, specific? Oh, that was brilliant. <laughs> Those were important messages that we'd love to convey um, that I appreciate you doing spontaneously. <laughs> did you have um, did you have a chart that you wanted to show from your culture or is it still yeah, available? I, mm -hmm. I can. If you make me the host, I can share it. Or a co host or something. I can't share yet. Okay. You just made you a presenter. Perfect. Let me see if I can. As she's calling that up, if folks want to put any messages in the chat, we have her for another seven or eight minutes before <laughs> she has to go. But you're welcome to put a, a question for her in the chat if you've got a particular situation or any yes. comment to make. And but I work we well. See I, we work well with um, answering questions. I like doing that more than just talking, <laughs> talking, 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 which I'll talk forever. But so this is what we had to fill out for um, our culture over carbon, which is part of this grant. Um, and so we had a general, um, the zoos and aquariums had to kind of figure out some particular buildings that we aligned with. So, um, or that we all had on on grounds or whatnot. So um, we did an overall kind of brief view and um, of our space. And then as you can see, we um, had some particular uh, buildings that we all focused on um, our, you know, what I already talked about, what type of energy meters, um, gas, electric, um, the square footage of the space, the conditioned space. Um, not all of our buildings are heated and cooled, so it was nice to break them down for each building. Um, and then, like I said, some of that gathered information as far as some of the building history or what we do with the, the data. So that's kind of down here further. Um, if they have a building automated system, what you know what year they were built we write we 
plugged in when there was renovations. Um, so you, you'll find that, like I said, a lot of people are going to have that. And then um, we had our, our database of for the different gas and electric, um, what we were using per building, um, the breakdown. And this literally, I was like, oh, I can get you that instantly. <laughs> when that was part of the data some of the building information took me a little bit longer because it's a bit specific but um yeah this was kind of the chart we used it's a little different than um the portfolio manager breakout but um everyone was very helpful if we had something that was already in a, a particular format we could send it in and they could kind of adjust it so we were all kind of matching uh the way the data was being input so hopefully that yeah I see that Misha asked a question. Um, sure. Have you added any gas or electric meters in your tenure to making the to make the tracking the consumption of a specific space easier? Um. So or were these all ready there? Yes, yes, we have. Um, on our newer buildings, um, it's nice because that. I didn't get into this part, but I did a huge thing during the pandemic. The zoo was shut down for several months and I went and took pictures and located every single meter on ground since we were closed. Um, and we have been working collectively. Again, this is kind of something that if you get everybody rallied together, um, there are some meters that we know run multiple buildings, but we weren't sure um, cause this is, we're, we're over a hundred years old. So we weren't sure some of them, what all of they, they did, you know, what all they were, um, what buildings they fed to. So now anytime we have a power outage or we have to shut something down, we make a, a, a note on who has lost power, um, so that we can continue to update that. But all of our newer buildings, we're trying to get more specific that they are, um, only online with one meter so we can track very closely um, and then another big piece is um over not since uh our data was submitted but over the last few years like you said when we started collecting data we've renamed some because they were incorrect <laughs> um we've renamed some of the names and then also um with that um with us us tracking and like i said adding the the um the building or the building specific, we've also added the um, building automated systems. We had a couple that were on an outdated system. We have now upgraded our building automated system in the last few years. And every building that was on an older one has been integrated into the new one. And any new building or new construction project is now integrated into that, which has been a huge, huge help. Um, with, all around um, with me managing our energy usage and watching that and collecting data. And from a facility standpoint, um, it's so much more efficient. We can dig right in and see what maybe an issue is before they even have to go down to fix something. Um, so it was an easy um, sell all around <laughs> to get that uh, online for our campus. Um, and we're slowly adding more buildings to that program. And so for all of the listeners, uh, you might default to thinking somebody should have already done this. How come we haven't taken care of this yet? Very few institutions have already mm -hmm. done it. And what you're hearing now is that it's also a continuous improvement effort. You start, you refine, you update, you get a new grant opportunity or yeah. you get a crisis. And then recovery gives you an opportunity to improve the process. So it's it is continuous. And the goal is that if you already start from a good solid base, that mm -hmm. each of those transitions hopefully will be easier. And then any response for reporting requests from a project like this or from your parent organization or from your city, if there are new guidelines, you'll be able to, to engage with that much more quickly and comfortably while still doing your day jobs. So. Absolutely. And I think that uh, that's a great point that I'd like to end on. I feel like just um, being in the sustainability world, I feel like there's a lot of 
where you're comparing or you think you're behind. And there are so many organizations that are doing very well in one thing, but there's always a lot of basics that somebody hasn't done yet. So I think the 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 biggest hurdle for anybody that's doing work like this is to not feel like they're behind or we should have started this a long time ago. Um, there's always something coming up that you think that you're just now getting started with. And the best thing to do is just start trying to collect data. No matter if it's messy, you'll build on it every year um, and get, you know, refine that and get better and better. Um, so, but yeah, communication and reaching out and putting it out into your organization has been our biggest key factor into, you know, not only tracking this, but a lot of other things. Um, because like I said, you'll be surprised who has the information you're looking for. Oh, marvelous. Thank you so much, Stacia. We really yeah. appreciate it. Yep. Anytime. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. All right. So I'm going to share my screen to help out Misha a little bit here, and I will hand it over to her. There you go. Thank you. I don't well, see it you quite don't yet. See it yet. Yeah, not quite. <laughs> Almost. And first, we'll go back to the title slide. Here's Misha <laughs> joining us, and now Misha's dad. Over to you. I'm still not seeing the slides, Sarah, if you are intending to be sharing them. <laughs> In the meantime, I can just introduce myself. Now I see them. Thank you. Uh, for those who may not know me, uh, my name is Misha Egolf. I'm a technical associate at New Buildings Institute. Um, I've an emailed with a lot of folks uh, in the Culture Over Carbon project because um, I was responsible for kind of the data collection and analysis. So um, following up on that great information from Stacia, I wanted to share just some insights that we saw um, from our data collection process, um, specifically looking at uh, organizations that uh, are part of a larger entity, maybe have a parent organization or might consider them some part of an umbrella structure. Um, so just to kind of set the stage a little bit, one of the questions that we ask in our data collection sheet was, uh, we asked folks to self-identify um, their ownership type. And so you can see in this table that most people identified as a nonprofit, uh, ownership. A uh, few people identified themselves as private ownership. And then we had a variety of other options. Um, you'll notice that we have municipal and city and state were all unique options. So um, you might take that with a grain of salt. Some folks might interpret city versus municipal differently. Um, so just keep in mind that is one limitation. But uh, this, is, this is how people self-selected um, and so I think especially looking at the universities, um, the cities or states, municipal and federal, those are those are the ones where we started to see this kind of um, ownership uh, being split into like an umbrella structure. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more in the next slide. But I also just wanted to note that. Um, yeah, for the most part, participants in our project. Uh, own the property themselves, uh, but there were 15 institutions that actually lease some portion of their space um, versus owning it themselves. So we did have some representation from that group as well. Um, and in terms of the umbrella structure, um, the way that we ask it in the data collection sheet was, um, are you a part of an umbrella structure? So again, maybe open to interpretation a little bit, but uh, 21 institutions uh, did indicate that they are part of an umbrella structure or some sort of larger entity. Next slide, please, Sarah. Uh, so this is a breakdown of those 21 institutions that said that they <laughs> are part of a, uh, another entity. Oh. oh, it sounds like somebody thinks that this slide is very funny. <laughs> right. uh, so we had eight that were eight nonprofits that identified as being a part of an umbrella structure for universities, which I think is interesting. That's half of our university uh, based institutions, which kind of makes sense. Uh, and then a kind of mix of, of all the others. 
Um, 19 of the 21 provided monthly energy data to get a first view report uh, with the detailed energy analytics. Uh, one provided annual data only, and that was kind of a unique scenario because that institution was going through a renovation project. And so it didn't make a lot of sense for them to provide really detailed data because their data was about to change quite a bit uh, with their renovation. Uh, and then there was only one that was unable to provide the data that we needed to do a first view report. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. Um, I also just wanted to note that um, real quick, uh, 15 out of the 21, so most of these institutions um, said that they do have a building management system. So going back to what Stacia said about how that can be really a helpful tool uh, to start tracking data and things like that, just keep that in mind. So um, this slide shares some of the challenges that we heard from participants in this project. So this might look familiar <laughs> to some of you. Uh, the first one here is actually the issue that was experienced by the one participant who was unable to get a first view report. Um, part of their building was served by STEAM, uh, District STEAM system. And so because it was a campus owned and operated system uh, that they had not elected to individually submeter the buildings, um, there was no way to know how much steam their building, this, this cultural institution, was using. Um, it's just like one university-wide number. So obviously that is a challenge um, because the steam was providing heating um, for at least some portion of the building. And so that, that would be potentially a significant amount of energy. Uh, the other issue that we heard a lot in terms of people trying to get energy data to share with us was that, you know, they aren't directly managing the utility bills. So again, going back to what Stacia mentioned, um, the building owner is the one managing uh, those bills. So that might be the university again, or the city, um, or just, yeah, another department, um, like Stacia was mentioning, the finance department. Uh, lots of issues as well in terms of how the meter names map to the spaces within the institution. So I feel like Stacia just set this slide up perfectly. Uh, all of these issues. Um, also record keeping in inconsistencies. If you're working as part of a parent organization, anytime that there's a, a change in the ownership entity or any sort of staff, like let's say the finance department has been in charge of this in the past and then the staff of the finance department changes, uh, the way that they track that data might change, things might get lost. So that's another uh, roadblock that some people were experiencing. And lastly, this isn't necessarily um, relevant to the energy data itself, but in terms of thinking about budgeting, especially for upgrades and things like that, um, a few institutions reported that their annual energy or their annual maintenance budget was not tracked separately from the overall campus budget. Uh, and so that creates issues. Um, we have a quote here from one of our participants that uh, was kind of lamenting that, um, you know, any sort of uh, upgrade projects uh, that go beyond critical maintenance, um, there's no kind of dedicated way for them to plan for that financially. So I just shared all of these challenges all of these ways, it's really difficult to get this data. Uh, but again, I'm going to go back to state what Stacia was saying and just say, you know, you have to start small, start somewhere. And so we tried to compile here uh, on this slide some of uh, our suggestions of from what we saw from our data collection of things that did work for participants to be able to work through and actually get the data that they needed to get that detailed first view report and kind of set that baseline so that they could continue tracking energy in the future. Um, so first and foremost, like Stacia said, find the right contact. Uh, that might be someone in the finance department. It might not be where you would think. Uh, asking specific questions. Uh, we found through some emails back and forth that um, screenshots can be really helpful. Uh, it is incredibly easy to misunderstand each other via email. So sometimes just picking up the phone and having a really brief phone call can really clarify a question. And instead of asking very broad questions about, you know, where is this thing? You know, say, this is what I'm looking for and this is why I need it and like what I'm trying to get to, because maybe that'll trigger a light bulb moment uh, on the other end. Uh, and also just uh, being persistent. 
Uh, sometimes there might be multiple contacts, uh, multiple departments, like Stacia mentioned, uh, it can be a real team effort. And, you know, not being afraid to send that follow-up email if you haven't heard anything after a week or so. Um, and also just uh, try to use it as an opportunity. You know, if you have the opportunity to gather this data, just understanding um, how and where the data is stored. Like Stacia mentioned, if there are opportunities for you to just add a column to an existing spreadsheet, definitely do that because that's going to be way easier than starting from scratch. Um, and then also, uh, you know, tying it all into this project, uh, see if the parent organization can maintain or already does maintain a portfolio manager account, and maybe they already have that data uh, hidden away somewhere, um, and they've been tracking it, and you just need to be, uh, it needs to be shared with you. Um, and then also for existing building management systems, um, considering if uh, submeters are an option. We also had one institution report that they actually worked with a third-party vendor to monitor and report on energy use. Um, so that's something to consider. Obviously, that's an expense that may not be possible for everyone, but just trying to kind of think outside the box about how you can uh, make it easy for yourself to get a process in place um, so that after this kind of upfront push to get a process set up, it goes really smoothly. Um, and just one other note, uh, you know, I think that there was one institution that said that they had a challenge with data storage. Um, so that's why I have this point about data storage here. Just thinking about um, they were this institution was unable to get historical data because there was a, some sort of system error. And so they actually lost a lot of their historical data. So also, you know, when you embark on this process, it's a good time to ask questions and say, OK, how is this being backed up uh, in the case that we have a, a power surge or something or we change, uh, you know, IT vendors? Are we going to lose any data um, as part of that? So just trying to kind of think ahead a little bit um, again to make it easier for yourself uh, in the future. And I will add one last note about the portfolio manager option um, for more advanced users, especially like larger, like a city or an institution um, that maybe has a more dedicated staff person who could help support. Um, they do offer an API option where you can actually get it set up um, so that your energy data will automatically load into Portfolio Manager every month. So if that's something that folks are curious about, you know, we can definitely talk a little bit about that. Um, so that is another time saver if you have the infrastructure and ability to do that. Um, and my last, last note, I know I've been saying it's my last note for several notes. Um, we are conducting interviews right now to get some additional insights on this and other topics so that we can provide some really good uh, feedback for the, for the industry in the form of our final report, which is expected this summer. So I want to just say thank you so much for those who are on this call that have been participating as part of this project and have provided this really helpful information so that we can then uh, share it with the broader industry. And with that, I will pass it back to you, Sarah. <laughs> Marvelous. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to uh, remind folks that we've got this series of office hours and presentations to bring you along in the process because different folks need different types of information. You might not be, some folks might not have um, parent issues. Um, somebody might have other issues and they want to drop in on any of these other sessions and tell you that the next session that we're having, um, we'll have staff from Energy Star Portfolio Manager talking about this process of creating enough, they're there, enough of us putting data in Energy Star Portfolio Manager to eventually develop a category that helps all of us benchmark energy use in museums, a special museums category. Um, the session that presented in March will be about delivered fuel. So if you have oil delivered or you have um, uh, some places even have coal delivered or if they have fuel that comes in a different format, how to measure it, or if you generate 
fuel, so generate energy so that you are using um, solar power or geothermal energy or something else that has to be, uh, that influences your data. We'll be um, having a session specially on that. But all of these sessions have an about at least 15 or more minutes for office hours for talking about your own particular situation, because we want to be able to bring everyone along till they get to this point where we're all reporting. So a, a reminder that this is the link that if you'd like to sign on to the Carbon Day Reporting Project, you can still attend all of these sessions, whether or not you sign on now, yeah. later, or ever. Um, but if you wanted to put your name on the list and say to the museum field, we think this work is important, we're doing it. Um, we hope that will encourage others to do it. So this is the sign up form that just says that you'll be willing to report. It has some details about um, whether or not you can record anonymous reporting of data. You'd still be listed as a member of Carbon Inventory Project, but um, we are not attributing any data to individual institutions. And you have a chance to review that all on the sign up sheet there. And then a little bit of news before we get to the office hours discussion is that the Carbon Inventory Project and Culture Over Carbon have both been accepted for different presentations at the annual museum conference in Denver this year. We're very excited about it because we get to share it with the world. We get to have some voices from people who've been participating will be there and we'll get to see each other in person if you're able to attend. So we're really pleased that we're going to have that platform at AAM. And I'll close the formal presentation part and we can have a conversation if anyone has questions. And we'll let you know that we're going to remain here as long as there's anyone in the room. But if uh, you have other things to do and no questions to ask at this time, please feel free to go ahead and move on with your day. But we're glad that you joined us. Thanks. Hi, this is Phil Wagshaw from the Wild Center. Um, I, I'm curious about, we have a couple of like intern houses that aren't actually uh, on the campus um, and they have separate meters and whatnot. Um, I think it's important for us to, to track how much energy they're using, but for the purposes of this program, is it is it important to include those ancillary buildings as well? I mean, and you know, because they are occupied by interns or fellows, um, we have some control, but not total control over the usage in those places as well. What do you think? So I'm pro my first answer is yes, it's, it's museum operations, right? So I'm trying to filter on whether or not that's the correct answer. <laughs> Um, and, and that was my that was my initial thing because it is it is part of the museum itself but it's not mm -hmm. and the other thing is the other problem i have is um the way we initially set up our uh portfolio manager it set up is like a individual building a single building mm -hmm. because we have we have one electric meter for the entire facility, but then we have multiple, we have uh, two propane uh, tanks, so we get deliveries that are separated out clearly for those. But then with these additional buildings that are off campus, we also have electrical meters. So I, I'm just, if you're trying to, if you're trying to look at what is the um, energy intensity for the facility for the museum as it operates that's a little bit different than having these houses there too so i, I i'm just i'm scratching my head yeah. well and i don't want to quite compare your interns to zoo residents <laughs> <Let's> say, <laughs> you haven't met is, my interns hold on this is a, this is a distributed <laughs> campus um and it seems to me that it would qualify as part of museum operations what okay. do you think, Misha? 
Yeah, I think it depends on what lens you're looking through. I think, Sarah, you're absolutely right. It is definitely part of operations. Um, I will say for the thinking about the end game of the Energy Star Portfolio Manager score uh, for museums, I would say that they may not consider that as like a requirement because it's not that end use. It's not like a museum end use, mm. right? It's more of like a housing, like it would be more like a single family home kind of characterization, right? Um, I think that the only way that, the only other thing you might think about is the square footage of those intern houses. And if they're over, you know, if they're like dormitories and they're really large, then you know, that might make more of a case of going ahead and starting to track that data because you might have to deal with benchmarking requirements in the future and things like that. Yeah, these are these are basically single family homes where we just, you know, utilize the bedrooms to house interns because it's close to close to the museum and that's where they stay and that's part of their stipend for when they're for the, for for when they're employed. So, um Okay, and we're, we're tracking that data. It's not like it's not like it's um, it's not like we're not looking at it. I just wanted to understand for your purposes the best approach. So it's a great um, question, and I mm -hmm. I would propose Sarah that we even take it back to the ESPM team like Brendan and just just verify. Yeah. But my sense is that especially in our conversations with them, they. They're more interested, especially for the benchmarking side of things, in the the actual museum uh, operations. Okay. And that's good for us to think about having an FAQ for future reporting. You know, what are the purposes? How do you make a choice between those options depending upon the purpose? So thank you, Bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we uh, we will talk about um, the accounting for um like alternative energy sources in some future because we we have tracked we have a pellet boiler and we also have solar panels and we've tracked those so we just have to um figure out how to report those and and we separate the meters out so i guess it's it's all information yeah march will be the one for you on that one then and so then when do, you, when, when do we submit the data uh we need to have it in time for calculating starting on the 1st of June, uh, okay. but we'll take it before then. But if you wait until after March in order to check on that delivered fuel reporting or generated fuel, that's fine. Well, we have again, like we've separated it out in the meter, so I could submit all that data. And I think you already, um, NBI had access. Do you also have access? Yes. So, so um, you know, I could, so it's just a matter of, me communicating to you that hey the the information is up to date and current and you can yeah. go in and grab it is that how that's going to work yeah i think that that is still kind of to be determined in terms of the exact mechanics of how it's going to work but generally yeah you know if we mm -hmm. have access to the data already we're not going to ask you to jump through more hoops um mm -hmm. but there are going to be folks that you know maybe you're going to be participating in this that didn't participate in culture over carbon so we want to make sure we have a pathway for them you know, as well. Sure. Okay. I, I, mm -hmm. The only thing I have left is to get my uh, last bills in from, you know, November or December right. for the for the power and, and we should be all set. So. Excellent. Good. Thank you. Well, thank you very mm -hmm. much. Appreciate your help. Anyone else? So I'm 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 a little bit of a lurker because I'm have we haven't actually enrolled in the project or anything like that. So I'm just curious. I'm a little bit late in the game. Um, is it is there are there still more is there still options for additional organizations to enroll or would we be getting in at like a next round or would I just be kind of learning how to start doing this kind? Of, I mean, I I did it at a I did Energy Star at a past in a past life, which Sarah's mm -hmm. aware of, and she worked with me on that. But um, at a new organization newish um and we haven't haven't we started briefly under our previous staff member who left and then and i don't know if we did energy star or not but um 
What does it look like for someone who's just coming into the mix now? Well, we found as we were setting up Culture Over Carbon a year ago that a, a lot of people weren't able to join at that time. And they couldn't go through the whole process with NBI of getting a first view report. But there was interest um, and need for support. So that's why the Carbon Inventory Project as a subset got started, so that anyone who couldn't participate in the first one could at least have some support for starting to measure their energy. They won't get the next level review that NBI did as part of culture over carbon because they've moved on to the next topic but it still allows you to participate and have the support from nbi of learning how to get that data in correctly answering questions like from phil so you are not too late uh, this is actually an excellent time to join because within a week or so you will have all of 12 months probably of energy data for 2022 to start working through putting into energy star portfolio manager um, and then we'll definitely be check the March 23rd date because we do have additional electricity. We have <coughs> heating oil and propane in various capacities. And, and yep. I'm now at an organization that has its, we're, we're, we don't, not a parent organization, but we have five acres and five, well, I don't know, four, four primary buildings, outbuildings, a building we acquired that we're going to, you know, we have, it's, it's, a, it's more complicated than where I was, what I was dealing with before. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's how, that's what this is for, is to yeah. give you that coaching. So there's, okay. for all of those meetings, there's office hours time at the end for specific questions, and you're not taking yeah. up anybody's time. We're inviting you to come and ask the question. Bring okay. your sheets and your questions. Yeah. Well, and if it's helpful to, you know, I'm happy, you know, if you want to shoot me an email in advance and say, this is something I'd really like you to touch on, you know, but you want to be more anonymous and not bring it up during the call, that's, you're also more than welcome to do that. Okay, thank you. We'd love to have you. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. <laughs> and well, and it's, it's, it is, we're, we're also just beginning the process of some new visioning work and a new strategic plan. And we sit on the, we sit on the ocean um, on this five acre campus. And so I think I, I will be pushing hard for resilience and sustainability to be part of our kind of values process so i'm hoping mm -hmm. that that gets uh, you know gets a solid institutional kind of push behind doing the work that's great well and what stacia was saying about uh no better time than when there's another team a group of people doing this work as well you know so it doesn't cost you to get this information on how to do the work you've got a whole bunch of other people you can call on not just those you see on the screen right now um, it's the easiest way to get started Anything else, Nina? All right, well. Could I could, yeah, I, sorry, yeah. could I ask one other quick question that's kind of off topic? Sure. Um, when when you look at source three, we're trying to do uh, do the EPA fill out like the EPA sheet and stuff with source three usage for energy for like visitors and stuff. Do you do you know how other other institutions are doing that? Um, I I think you're meaning scope scope, scope three. three. Yeah. I'm scope sorry. three. Um, there's lots of discussion in the museum field about doing the full scope greenhouse gas emissions, um, but I don't think there's any consistency in it. Okay. Yeah, um, using various calculators that are sort of vague online, um, recognizing that that's where we are at the moment. There is um, a program that Environment and Culture Partners runs called the Carbon Neutral Visiting Initiative where we work with a carbon offset group that helps us help the museum calculate what it looks like for the visitor footprint. You know, the distance, who comes from how far away and what kind of vehicle sort of thing and estimate what those emissions are. And then identify if you wanted to offset it or have the visitors choose to offset it, um, what a partner program might look like that you would have as a way to offset those scope three. 
So they would help with that travel um, calculation. Yeah, I think I think at this point we're just I'm just trying to quantify that number in some way that is. And I don't want to say standardized, but some way that other people would accept as a reasonable methodology to come up with what that number is. Mm -hmm. So. OK, yeah. well, I know that the Children's Museum in Acton, Massachusetts um, did estimates from visitor zip codes. Right. So they knew, you know, they could sort of estimate how many people are coming, how far, and it was, it was calculation. Yeah, it's it Just is it is a big spreadsheet for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. okay. Well, we'll we'll we may pursue that for maybe we'll do a day and see what it looks like mm -hmm. and multiply it out. I don't know. Mm -hmm. so, well, okay. and the idea of pilot projects in anything you do with sustainability staff with sustainability projects is pilot it, segment it, do a bit, test it, see what you learn, and then expand to the next level. And that's always a good path because it's complex and we're all still figuring it out. Okay, sounds great. Hey, thanks for the help. Thanks for the session, I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And I see Stephanie just made, a, uh, sent a message in the chat that the uh, staff travel was included as part of the scope three work for Discovery Museum. Yeah, so so the so the the staff travel I think is going to be easier, and we're we're uh, working on establishing a green team and and moving forward with that, and uh, that'll be part of the, you know, tell us tell us your mileage and what kind of vehicle you have, and we'll figure that mm -hmm. out. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, lot to it. All Thanks right. So good. Good question. Thank you. And uh, Julie is asking about not um, not being available on the 23rd of March. Yes, it will be recorded and kept online. And so if you want to feed questions to Misha before that meeting so that she answers them, then you'll be sure of getting it. Well, thank you, everyone. Appreciate participation. Good questions. And yeah. on to the next month's meeting. Thank you.